Good morning and happy Sabbath to everybody. Our scripture reading today is found in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verses 12 to 17. And I'm reading from the King, uh, book, King James Version. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, This thing says, He who has the sharp to add sharps. I know your words and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you because you have dared those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus, you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans with things I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto you quickly and will fight against them with the swords of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and a stone a new name, written which no one knows except him who received it. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Thank you that you have come to Central Filipino Church to come worship with us. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are just so thankful that we are in the moment to receive your word. Father, Lord, just like the prayer in that song, we want you near to us. So, Father, in this moment, let the Holy Spirit be our teacher, not I, so that we may understand your full truth, so that this can be practical in our lives, so we may get to understand your true beauty. Guide each and every one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The message today is entitled, Creeping Compromise. This is a series that we have started a few weeks ago in, that is going to go over pretty much the whole book of Revelation, but as of now, we're going through the seven churches. Now, have, did everyone get their handouts? Amen. Amen. So the message today is Creeping Compromise. Now, the whole point of this message is to stay faithful. What did I say? Stay faithful. It's very interesting. Compromise. It's good to have compromise when it comes to relationships. Do you agree? But when it comes to our spiritual faith, it could lead to our utter demise. Take a, um, take a notice at what this says. Compromise. The silent killer of the Christian life. Do you guys agree with that? The silent killer of our Christian life. In my daily devotionals, I've been going through the book of Hebrews. And in Hebrews 1, I believe, or Hebrews 2, it says that we need to stay true to the word lest we drift away. Now, we, come, we have to come to the conclusion. Many people who might call themselves atheists or people who are against the truth or against religion, it came through a slow progression of moving further and further away from the truth. Just a few months ago, me and Jeline did a triathlon. How many of you know what a triathlon is? A triathlon is three types of exercises. It starts off with swimming. Any of you know who, how to swim? Swimming, we did a triathlon sprint, so it wasn't a full Ironman. This was a sprint, so it was 
0.5 of a swim in the bay in San Diego. Right after that, we went biking 12 miles, and then we finished it off with three miles. How about that for a Sunday morning? Would you guys like to do that? <laughs> for some, they enjoy it, like me. But in this triathlon, this triathlon sprint, I remember very clearly, this was my first time swimming in open water. For anyone who know how to swim and who have ever swam in the ocean, it could be terrifying. Normally, when you swim in a lap, you look down on the ground, and if ever you're tired, you stop, you stand, and just relax. But when it comes to the ocean, you look down, and what do you see? Darkness. This was my first time doing it for me and Jeline. And so we, I went into the water, and I thought everything was fine. Okay, this is kind of cool weather. This is nice, kind of breezy, a little chilly, but I think I could do it. 0.5 a mile. I've trained for this. I am prepared. I'm ready. When they said go, everyone swam forward. I was the last person. In fact, at the end of the triathlon, I was number 357 out of 357. <laughs> so I swam. I, was, I, f I felt good. Um, I was just doing my strokes. I felt comfortable. But for some, some reason, something was in my ears. Someone was saying something. All I heard in my ears was... <laughs> I just kept going. I thought people were just screaming and shouting, just egging me on. I kept swimming. I kept going. I kept going. And then finally, I thought to myself, oh, wait a minute. I need to look up. I need to know where I am. And so after I took that breath of air, I looked up. And I realized one big mistake. The buoy where I had to turn around was right over here. And when the scale of what I'm presenting to you, this is the buoy, I'm right over here. I probably swam more than 0.5 a mile. And so it's very telling for us today when we talk about compromise, we need to be careful. Because compromise creeps in our lives. Compromise comes in our lives, and slowly but surely, little by little, the more we don't pray, the more we don't do devotions, the more we don't be active in the church, the more we don't want to go to, on Sabbath, the more we want to hang out with our friends, the more we see the church is more of a business or more of a place of just a gathering, the easier it is for compromise to creep in our hearts. And sooner or later, when Jesus comes, we will say, I do not know this man. This is very telling for our day and age. And this is why the seven churches is so important for us to understand. The first church we learned, they were people who lost their first love. The second church, nothing bad about them. Because they went through persecution, and we learn through persecution, it leads to two groups of people, people who will continue in their faith or downright go against it. It will, so to say, shake the church. It will reveal who truly is of God and who is of not. And so now we're going down the history, and we're seeing what the next church is all about. It's all about compromise. Now, I want you guys, as an introduction, go to Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to stay in the book of Revelation. So don't worry, we're not going to flip through. So just stay, park your car, park your tent to the book of Revelation. We're going to stay right there, all right? Revelation 1, verse 1. Let's see what it has to say. Revelation 1, verse 1 tells us exactly what this book is all about. Many people think it's very scary, it's full of apocalypse, a full of beasts, but in fact, it's actually the gospel. Revelation 1 verse 1, it reads, the revelation of who? Jesus Christ. The beast, Mark of the Beast 666, is all good to know, but the main purpose of the book of Revelation is to reveal who? Jesus Christ. Great job. Revelation of Jesus Christ. 
Continuing on, which God gave him to show his servants things. Now I want you to pay attention to this. Things which must what? Shortly take place. Now we always think Revelation is the end of the book. It's talking about last day events. But to John, live, staying in the island of Patmos, who is in prison around the first few centuries of the Christian life, the angel is saying to him, these things will what? Shortly take place. So this is a good understanding of go approaching the book of Revelation. This is actually helping us understand what happens directly at the time of John in the island of Patmos all the way down to Jesus' second coming. So for all of us today, we have to realize Revelation is written historically. What did I say? It is written historically in advance. So the first half of Revelation, the seven trumpets, the seven seals, all these are all historical background to help us understand where we are today. Guess what? Who do we say Laodicea is all of, is? Who do you think that is? Us. So if you put that in perspective, if Laodicea, the end time church, this last church, then the first church talks about the first church and it goes onward throughout church history. So these seven churches symbolize the seven distinct periods, the seven distinct periods of church history. So if you look at your handout, you'll go right in line. The seven churches symbolize the seven distinct periods of church history. The church of Ephesus describes the first Christians from 100 AD. They lost their first love, but they were good in their works. They were able to know exactly what is true and what is false. And then the church of Smyrna, they were going through heavy persecution. We learned that and we saw prophetically from 303 to 313, Revelation says just 100 years ago, saying exactly that they will have tribulation for 10 days. 10 days equals 10 years. Look at church history. Diocletian, under his reign, marked the hardest, the strongest persecutions on Christians from 303 to 313. But then what happens right after 313? Now let's look at Pergamus. Let's go to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2 and verse Revelation 2, verse 12. Revelation 2, verse 12. Let's go ahead and read it. It reads, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos writes, These things says, He who has the sharp two-edged sword. So all throughout these churches, he identifies himself specifically for these churches. Switch over to the microphone. All right. Is that a little better? All right. So Revelation 2 verse 13, it tells us that Jesus is the one who has the sharp two edged sword. This is very telling to Pergamus. In Pergamus, the two edged sword describes power. It describes authority. Caesar had a two edged sword. The Roman army had a two edged sword. And so it just describes that they have political power, political strength. But Jesus is saying, no, not Caesar have strength. Roman armies don't have strength. I have ultimate strength. And we see Jesus is saying that he is the ultimate authority, not by strength, but by his 
word. In the end, he will have the last say. In the end, he will have the strength. He will have the authority that all those political powers saying this and that in terms of war and power, in the end, Jesus will have the last say. Look at Hebrews 4 verse 12 on the screen. For the word of God is living and powerful, amen, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Truth is the truth. No matter how hard you try to sugarcoat things, truth will always be the truth. And it's good to get those loving messages. But sometimes we have to be put in our right place. Do you agree with that? <laughs> we have to understand the truth. And what's amazing to know, it seems like everything's not working right now. We have to know that the truth will indeed set us free. Ephesians 6 verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation. This is the armor of God. And the sword of the Spirit, which is word of God. So God's word is sure and exact. And in the end, it's not going to matter what I say. It's going to matter who God's, what, what the Lord says. So I could say anything. I could say whatever on this pulpit but you have to be like the church of Ephesus. Know exactly what's right and what's wrong. It's not what the preacher says. It's not what Pastor Rossetti says. It is what the Lord says. Amen? So we have to come to the conclusion. We are not followers of certain pastors, certain speakers on 3ABN or Hope Channel. We are followers of God. And we always have to be aware and put your preachers, your, your pastors on their toes that if they're not saying the right thing, tell them. So we have to know the word of God. And so we now go into a man called Constantine. Jesus here is speaking to a group of people who is going to compromise in their faith. So let's take a little quick history lesson. Constantine the Great. Constantine the Great. In 312 AD, Constantine marches into the city of Rome. Have you heard of that name before? Constantinople? Constantine? We hear this in a lot in Revelation uh, seminars on who changed the day of, the, of Sabbath. Here's the history lesson. In 312, Constantine marches onto the city of Rome. Roman Empire is divided by Diocletian. If you know church history, Diocletian divided up his power into a tetrarchy. Tetrarchy is four. So like Junior Caesars and um, Augustines. And they are people who are looking after certain parts of Rome. But because of that, it became a power struggle. So after Diocletian died, who was going to control the Roman Empire? It was ripe for a takeover. So Constantine comes in the scene, and then on October 28, 312, a battle will occur that will name the next emperor of Rome. And that is called the Battle of Milvian Bridge on October 28, 312. Constantine was going against a guy who was an imposter named Maxentius. This man was a guy who was vying for the emperorship. But in the end, Constantine wins. And he tells his army to paint on their shield, Ki Ro. Can you say that with me? Ki Ro. On their shield, they write down, Ki and Ro. Now, this is very telling because in Greek, it spells out C-H-R. What do you think that's spelling? It is spelling Christ. 
So 10 years later, after he um, f- won the victory, 10 years later, he speaks to a historian named Eusebius. He tells to Eusebius exactly what happened. He went to the Battle of Melvian Bridge, and then he looks up into the sky, the cross. He looks up into the cross, and he, sa- he says it himself, that the Lord commanded him to write, Ki Ro, in symbol of Christ, and say, move this direction, and you will win. And if you win, you have to be an emperor, but be a Christian. So this man, who is from a pagan background, supposedly converts. Actually, if you look down in church history, at the end of his life, then he gets baptized. So we don't know exactly if he was a nominal Christian, if he was a true Christian. Most historians say he was a nominal social Christian, not a full-fledged believer in Christ. So he turns into a Christian, and that is where the plot twist happens. Because for the longest time, from 303 to 313, there was persecution. For the longest time, Christians had no civil authority. For the longest time, Christians were always looked down upon. For the longest time, Christians worshipped in secret. Because if they did anything, people would think they would be cannibals because they did the Lord's Supper. And so we see these Christians are now taken aback. Here is a plot twist in history. The biggest powerful emperor of the time is Christian. Constantine leads the Roman Empire as a Christian. And this move, pay attention to this, this move will change and shape East and West for centuries all the way to today. What Constantine did in his time as emperor changed the face of church forever. We start seeing Roman politics entering in our church, the way they lay out their service, the way they do their things. They start influencing the church, and slowly but surely, we see what? We see compromise. So this is where it gets interesting. Christianity has been going through heavy persecution. And in 313 AD, Constantine makes a complete stop on all persecutions all throughout the Roman Empire. And he labeled it under the Edict of Milan. Have you heard of that before? The Edict of Milan. So now, Christians are now free to practice their faith everywhere. And what's so amazing about these stories in the seven churches, they have so many connections, and we'll do this in a later sermon to connect all these connections. But we see that these seven churches connect back to Old Testament references. Who in the Old Testament went through heavy persecution and then leaves out of persecution into the promised land. The Israelites. So for the longest time, they're going through persecution, and then they head out to the promised land, and they're slowly trying to get rid of the Babylonian influence, the Egyptian influence. That's so long for them to get into the promised land because they had to be purified. And when they get to the promised land, they, as if they kick their feet back, they relax and say, I'm done. The persecution's over. The move in through the wilderness is over. Now I relax. I am retired. I could relax. I could live my life normally now. And that see compromise. No more do they trust in their heavenly father. They now exclaim to God, give us a king. And this, Saul, this man named Saul, who may look like a perfect leader, ends up going against God himself. He may look perfect. 
He may look great, but he didn't have God in his heart. And we see a small microcosm of church and state coming together. And that is what we're seeing when Constantine leads the Roman Empire as a Christian. So persecution stops and it starts becoming fashionable. So when, ever, when did it ever become fashionable to be a Christian? But to them, it became fashionable to join because all the cool kids are doing it. The emperor is Christian. Might as well jump on board. Jump on the hype train. Get on in. Because as a Christian, now they are able to be elevated. In fact, Pergamus means elevation, being brought up. So all these people who compromise in the second church is now being elevated. And those who compromise, influenced by the Nicolaitans, are now being brought up to the forefront of Roman Empire politics. This is a situation Jesus is speaking about. They are going through compromise. Revelation 2 verse 13. Revelation 2 verse 13. Let's go ahead and read it. I know your works, where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Now this is where it gets serious. We are seeing the slow descent towards apostasy. The true church that was perfect, that was full of purity and love and, and connection to Jesus, is starting to let compromise slip in. And all of a sudden, it says in this verse, very emphatically, I know you're... Satan's throne is. Church 1 and Church 2, we have never saw this before until Church 3, where Satan himself takes a seat into his authority. Satan is setting up his authority in the church. He is now making his way into the faith. 2 Thessalonians 3, 2, verse 3 and 4. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, that son of perdition, who opposes and exalts, lift up, Pergamus, exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he sits as God. In the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So in this history, during the time of Constantine, he opens the door, the back door of the church, to let Satan in and to pose himself as a minister of light. And now we will see in the coming churches later, especially the Dark Ages, the next one, we will see that the only thing that people see when it comes to the truth is a man, the son of perdition. Continue on Isaiah 14, verse 13. For you have said your heart, I will ascend, Pergamus, exalting. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation, the highest place, on the farthest sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most God. And in this in church history, Satan is now entering into his throne. He's now entering his throne, waiting to confuse everyone of the truth. Confuse everyone. And it's so telling because Pergamus, center of pagan worship. Are we not living in pagan worship all around us? Pagan worship can be considered many things in entertainment, in media, in what we watch, in what we see. And surprisingly, 
you might have a little Babylonian in you, so if you, even if you call yourself Adventist, we might have a little Babylonian influence in us, in the way we see God and the way we see life. And so we are living in a way, world of pagan worship, and that is the same when it comes to Pergamos. In fact, they were so pagan, they actually worshiped a serpent. Pagan was a center of pagan worship. Have you ever heard this name? Asclepius, God of healing. It all comes back, I promise you. You'll know exactly who this person is. You know who this man is because you've seen it everywhere in hospitals. Asclepius, God of healing, a pagan god that people worshipped regularly it was actually a civic duty. If they don't, they'll be like the Christians, be shunned out out of society. So they had to worship a serpent and who can heal. So Satan is creeping into the church, asserting his counterfeit gospel of confusion into the church. Let's look at Revelation 3 verse 13. Continuing on in 3 verse 13. I know your works where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name and do not deny my faith, in which Antipas was who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. Jesus is simply talking about Christians who were resisting the change of compromise. These were people, and names are very important. We're going to look at that a little later. Names are very important because they are symbolic. Anti is against, pas is fathers. They were people who were against the church, the, the fathers of the church who are spreading false truth. So, but notice, verse 14, they were in danger of making compromise. Verse 14, but I have a few things against you. Because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam and who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. So names are symbolic. They represent something. These people did not live during the time of John when he was writing this book. And we'll see later on, Jezra, Jezebel comes in the, in the scene. But it's not literal. It's not a f person in their, in their time at they're living in. It is symbolic to the life they've lived. It is symbolic to the way they live their life and what they have done on this earth. So who is Balaam? And who is Balak? The doctrine of Balaam. Balaam was an Old Testament prophet. Do you know, guys know these, this story? He was an Old Testament prophet who turned his back on God for the sake of money. He committed spiritual adultery. And then Balak comes in this. God tries to tell Balaam, don't do it. But Balak comes around telling Balaam, come on, go curse the Israelites for me. I will give you money. So Balaam tries to curse Israel, wanted to see God's people conquered. This is Balak now. And Balaam compromises in one area. What did I say? He compromises in one area. The teachings of Balaam, the teachings of Balak are all about compromise. It is just one thing. But one thing can lead to our death. And that's why we have to be careful in our truth. We have to be stay close to Jesus. Because in a time where there is so much relative truth, so much subjectivity, no more objectivity, no moral high ground, people are making truth to what they perceive. We have to be careful because the moment we allow compromise to enter in our life, we may open the door for us to compromise in our faith and in our trust in God. So the story of Balaam and Balak is so telling for us today to never compromise in one 
of our movements and one of our faith. So the Christian church after Constantine faced many temptations, just, just like Balaam, just, just like Balak, and they were tempted because for the longest time they've been persecuted and now they're seeing compromises come into the church. What do we do? Well, we, we don't want to lose our civic duties. We don't want to lose our status. We don't want to lose our property again. And so they had to really figure out what to do because many people were turning into Christians for monetary gain. Many people were turning Christian because it was the thing at the time. And because many people weren't truly converted, many people didn't let go of their pagan beliefs. Many people didn't let go of their pagan worships. So this is a hard predicament for Christians. They don't want to face persecution. Maybe God did speak to Constantine. Maybe the Jews were right. They, they were waiting for the kingdom on earth. So the Christians at the time was probably trying to piece it all in their mind. Maybe this is right. Maybe Constantine was led by God so that they could have heaven as it is on earth. So they were piecing this out. They were tempted to let these compromises go because they were elevated. They were good. They weren't going through persecution. And in Revelation 2 verse 15, thus you have those who hold the doctrines of the Nicolaitans. We have heard this before in church one, if you remember. Nicolaitans all preached compromise. Don't be at the forefront of being weird being peculiar. That sounds familiar, Adventist. We are peculiar. We are weird, not worshiping on Sunday where everyone worships. We worship on Sabbath. What other weird things do we do? We don't eat pork. We don't eat supposed meat. We are vegetarian. <laughs> Can you attest to that? Amen? Some are vegan. Amen? Ah. <laughs> we are peculiar. We are weird. We do things differently from all mainline Christians. So these were peculiar people, and they didn't want to be peculiar, peculiar according to the Nicolaitans. So we see for the first time Satan's power within the church that will drastically influence our church today. And because of the compromise, we see compromise in one thing. What do I say? Compromise in one thing. Constantine issues the first Sunday law. If this was how it's going to be, how it went out in the time of Constantine, slow progression of compromise in the political sphere, in the sp spiritual sphere, don't you think this might happen exactly the way it turned out in Constantine to today? There is nothing new under the sun. Everything that has been going on today has happened in Old Testament, has happened in the New Testament, and we have warnings to help us understand and to be prepared and ready that when these hard times happen and they're happening now, we can be ready because if Constantine issues the very first Sunday law, we will see it again. So Jesus gives us a warning. Revelation 2 verse 16. Repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my ear. Pointing back to the sword of his mouth. The power, the authority that he has. And he doesn't want us to be destroyed. If he wants destroyed he would have killed us a long time ago this is a warning because he wants us saved he wants us to be in heaven and if you are here on friday nights we have just learned he wants everyone to be saved not the not just the adventist not just the christians but everyone every religion he wants everyone to know the truth to know his character, his goodness, and his mercy. Amidst being in Babylon, 
he says, come out, out, my people. He always sees his people amidst Babylon. So we see here, the writing is clear. We can't trust people. We have to trust the word of God. And so the reward is unbelievable as we start to close. Revelation verse 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone. And on the white stone, a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. This hidden man is none other than Jesus Christ, my dear brothers and sisters. In the temple, in the most holy place, it is Jesus. And we see the reward that if we repent and we go back to him, to our true love, he will not only give us hidden manna for us to eat, but he will give us a white stone with a new name. Jacob was turned from a deceiver, a supplanter, into Israel. Abram to Abraham. What will your new name be? Our names are marred by sin. Our names are marred by the things that we have been doing in this world. And when God brings us to heaven, we will get a new name. What name would that be for you and for me? the greatest faith I have ever seen. The most powerful, most peculiar man in the world. The one who will not let his faith shake. Is that your name? So as we conclude today and as we continue on in understanding these seven churches, let it strike close to our hearts. Let us not drift away. Let us stay close to his truth so that when the compromise happens, we will stay true and be ready for his soon return. May God bless us. This video was recorded from Central Filipino Seventh-day Adventist Church to help prepare people for the soon return of Jesus Christ. If you would like to visit us and for more information, go to www.centralfilipino.org.